Okay, hello everyone. Today we're looking at punishments as cruel entertainment. And to understand why watching or participating in cruel punishments was a form of entertainment for people in the late medieval and even into the early modern era. We've got three key terms that we want to look at, retribution, restitution, and deterrence. Now, retribution is to make sure that everyone in the general public feels that the offender has paid for the crime that they have committed. Now, retribution can be a monetary payment in money, it can be incarceration, so time spent in jail, or it could be in servitude by someone doing community service or working for the person that they have committed the crime against. Restitution is that the victim and the community feel that they've been paid back for the crime. So if it was a crime where money was stolen, that money is then replaced. And deterrence is a means of stopping others from committing a crime by having well-known knowledge of the potential consequences. And we're going to focus a lot today on deterrence. Medieval Torture and Punishment the medieval period saw brutal, violent, bloodthirsty punishments for criminals. From stealing to murder, the law had no fixed rules. Let's look at some of the methods and devices used to inflict agony to torture and punish. The pillory. The pillory was a form of public shaming and humiliation. The prisoner would place their neck and wrists through holes in a hinged wooden board, therefore trapping them in place for everyone to see. Passers-by would then mock, spit at, or throw rotten vegetables or animal excrements at the criminal. There was also the danger that the criminal could be killed when the crowd became too violent whilst throwing stones or bricks. Thumb screws. This device would cause agony for the victim by pressing the thumbs in with a metal screw. As the victim's fingers were slowly crushed, a confession was extracted. The rack. The rack was a large rectangular wooden frame constructed with a roller at both ends. The criminal had their ankles fastened on one end and their wrists to the other. The torturer cracked a handle to stretch the victim during interrogation, creating excruciating pain as limbs stretched from the body. The further the torturer went, the higher the chance of dislocation of muscles and ligaments and loud popping sounds. And if they still fail to extract a confession, a ripping of limbs from the body. Breaking wheel. With the breaking wheel, the victim would have their limbs tied to the spokes and revolved while the torturer hit them with an iron hammer, mangling their arms and legs and breaking their bones. They were then left out in the sun to the crows, burning at the stake. A horrific form of execution for blasphemers, thieves, and witches would see them burnt at the stake. Usually the condemned would die from suffocation before the flames started to burn their flesh. The suffering of the condemned could be prolonged by the executioner by making the fire small, causing loss of blood and heat stroke. Iron Chair This instrument of torture was covered in spikes on the seat, back and arm rests. When the victim was forced to sit on the chair, the spikes pushed into the flesh, causing extreme pain, and blood loss occurred when they sat out of it. So looking at retribution, restitution, and deterrence, we need to remember that watching or participating in the punishment of a criminal was an accepted form of public entertainment. The early modern period was marked by religious, political, and social upheaval. Uh, if you think back to what we've talked about with our Elizabethan unit, having Protestants, Puritans, and Catholics all living in England and all fighting against one another, uh, trying to prove whose religion was the right one and the best one, we can understand the context of the time where people were used to violence. It was more common to go and watch an example of bear baiting or cockfighting than it was to go to a play that had you know, a very positive uh, unviolent message, if you will. Now, the public burnings of Protestants during the reign of Mary Tudor, the whipping and branding of vagrants during the reign of Elizabeth I, and hangings, drawing, and quartering of traitors saw loads of crowds of onlookers come to watch. It was the must-see event in your small town or within your village if there was going to be an execution. 
the number of offences carrying the death penalty increased from about 50 in 1650 to 160 in 1750 and to 288 in 1815. A great deal was made of hangings. Held in public and with thousands in attendance the intention was that they would serve as a deterrent. Crime rates did not fall and although more crimes carried the death sentence they were usually commuted to imprisonment or more likely transportation. When executions did take place they were rowdy and lawless occasions. Sites like Tyburn in London became infamous as a venue for public hangings. Thousands of commoners would gather to watch and the rich would spectate from carriages or rented rooms. Executions were part of the popular culture and a gallows humor developed with people referring to a hanging fair, stretching or collar days. Vendors set up carts and booths and did a roaring trade in food, drink and souvenirs. The hangman's rope was sometimes cut up into pieces and sold to onlookers and the clothes of the dead were often auctioned off. So executions as entertainment. From the medieval era all the way up until the late 1700s, monarchs were more than happy to have executions take place in public. These executions provided entertainment for the masses, but they also acted as a deterrent. They reminded the audience members, if you commit the same crime as the criminal in front of you, you will have the same fate and you will be sentenced to death. When the 1800s rolled around and the Industrial Revolution started, this saw the reputation of Britain improve, and Britain was really seen as a global leader of technology, but also of human rights. And many philosophers started to question if public executions were actually appropriate for a nation of such prestige. By the mid-19th century, so middle of the 1800s, uh, people like Charles Dickens, they were arguing in their writing that these public executions were barbaric and that they should no longer be taking a place in public and they should solely be in private. So a little case study is Newgate Prison. So this site was used for over 700 years for executions. And it's been the site of the gallows after the Tyburn was retired from duty in 1783. Now we will get to the Tyburn in a moment. Watch a short video about what the Tyburn was. The executions took place in public with the gallows set up on Newgate Street all the way until 1868. And this coincides with the writing uh, of Charles Dickens as well uh, to eliminate these from the public eye. Executions still took place behind closed doors, but they were no longer for the public to see. The prison, whose former inmates included Casanova, William Kidd, and Daniel Defoe, was knocked down in 1904. Now, the Old Bailey occupies the main site with the head of the church uh, where the old jail's execution bell was, uh, which is home to one of the surviving walls of the Viaduct Tavern, where five former cells of the neighboring lockup are still visible within its basement. Hello, this is Matt from Fun London Tours. Excuse the noise, we're at the very busy traffic island very close to Marble Arch. But actually, if you walk around this area, something which I want to bring your attention to is just down here on the ground. As you can see, this is the memorial to the site of the Tyburn tree, which was approximately in this area here. Infamous in London's history in that it was the main, the principal location for executions here in London. So from 1196, when William Longbeard was, was hanged here up until 1783, you'd have thousands of people turning up to watch executions. The condemned man would be brought from Newgate Prison, which was around two and a half miles to the east, which is where the Old Bailey sits today, uh, brought along here on a cart, taken over to the gallows, which from 1571, they erected this triple Tyburn uh, tree, as it was known, uh, which could actually hang up to 24 people at a time. The cart would be taken to beneath the gallows, the man would be hanged with a rope, the cart would be pushed away, um, and then it could take anything up to 45 minutes for that person to die. So after the execution, you may be able to take home some kind of souvenir as such, some kind of gruesome souvenir with you. The hangman would often sell sections of the rope piece by piece, so you could take this home with you. You might also want to take the clothes from the criminal and maybe also um, if you're feeling particularly superstitious you may want to lay your hands on the the dead person because this may have some kind of mysterious curative powers but perhaps the most famous person to be executed at this site would have to be oliver cromwell 
the former Lord Protector of England. The interesting thing, though, was that he was already dead. Three years after Oliver Cromwell died, he was actually dug up by the very revengeful King Charles II uh, from Westminster Abbey. His body was taken to this point here, along with two other members of the Republic, Bradshaw and Ireton, and their corpses were hanged. The, the body was thrown into a pit. The head was then taken over to Westminster Hall in the Houses of Parliament and put on a 20-foot high pike to act as, I guess, as a deterrent to uh, future wannabe revolutionaries. So next time you're in the vicinity of Marble Arch, just take a short walk away from the tube station and check out this very small traffic island, which has this rather touching memorial to all those people who lost their lives uh, in London at the Tyburn Tree. Hello, my name is Matt. I'm a tour guide in London and I specialise in some of the most weird and wonderful stuff you can find out about this amazing city. So for more fun London facts, do come on one of our walking tours. It's funlondontours.com and hopefully see you soon. Now it's time for our bonus facts. An execution was a family affair. Uh, the whole family would go out and they were often held in a large field or somewhere within a town or just outside of a town. And this is an example of the Tyburn. We can see the three post tree uh, where up to, I believe it was 12 individuals could be hanged at any given time. And the whole family would go out. And if we have a look here, we see we have older men, we have young children, and they're all out to go and watch the show. Many families would bring a packed lunch with them, find a seat, and they would watch the executions throughout the day. Little known fact is executioners didn't actually wear masks. Now, if the execution was being taken place by beheading, uh, the executioner couldn't have anything on their face obstructing their view. Their job and their reputation was based on how quickly they could end the life of the criminal. This was not a case of wanting to torture someone or to extend the pain that they were in. And the execution was supposed to be very quick and swift and mostly painless. If an executioner wore a mask, they'd have a very difficult time seeing and they would often make mistakes. Now, executioners also uh, didn't have to wear masks because they often didn't stay in one village for a period of time. They traveled around on a circuit, if you will, going to different villages, committing the execution and moving on to the next. There was fear that if they stayed in a village for too long, uh, if anyone really popular within that village or town was executed, people might try to hurt the executioner. The first full-time executioner was from the north of France. His name was Nicolas Juhan, and he was nicknamed La Justice. He was the official executioner of a small town in Normandy in 1202. And after word spread that how good he was at executing people, the official position spread throughout many other capitals all across Western Europe. All right, so that's it for our lesson today on cruel entertainment. Uh, make sure you have a look at the quiz on Show My Homework and complete any other tasks set by your teacher.